There are a few announcements that I do want to uh, make and point out. But uh, in the meantime, before I get to the announcements, I do want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles for our call to worship. Our call to worship is Psalm 30, and uh, that's what we're going to be reading as we come before the Lord to worship Him and praise Him. So our call to worship is Psalm 30. And uh, so while you are turning there in your Bibles, uh, I hope most of you have noticed and seen that uh, we had Backyard Bible Club this week. There's a lot of pictures that are scrolling through, and uh, this was our second time this summer to have the Backyard Bible Club, and I want to say thank you to Annette, and I want to say thank you to Martina, and Wendy, and Heather, there you, there you are, Heather, and I want to say thank you to everybody who provided snacks and all of the things that helped to make Backyard Bible Club a success. Uh, I was only able to go on the Monday or on the Tuesday, but uh, I got to hear about it from my kids every day, and uh, it was a lot there I am. Uh, so it was a lot of fun, and I do know the kids learned a lot, and the Lord moved in their lives. So thank you for that. Thank you for those who were praying as well. That is a huge part of what makes Backyard Bible Club success. So uh, we will have the kids come up a little later on, and they are going to sing and uh, minister to us in music. So I'm excited for that. Uh, a couple of the other announcements that I do want to make and point out to people is that I, I need to remind us um, about masks. We don't need to wear the masks when we're sitting in our pews as long as we're keeping, you know, our six feet distance and we're doing a pretty good job of that in our pews. But uh, we, we really need to be um, diligent, I guess, of setting a good example and a good witness as we are mulling around uh, the service of the sanctuary uh, before and afterwards, uh, just so that we, if we can't be six feet apart, if we are going to be elbow to elbow, we should have our masks on uh, because uh, that does set a good example. But, you know, once we get outside, we don't need to have them on as long as we are practicing our physical distancing. So I just wanted to point that out. The other uh, little thing I wanted to point out, and I'm not sure if anybody is down there today, but we do have a TV set up uh, in the basement that watches the service and uh, has sound and picture and the whole nine yards. So if you want to go down there, it is a little cooler. Uh, or if you also want to go down there, if your kids are, you know, a little anxious, might, might get a little, you know, want to move around, you can feel free to go down there. There's tables set up for the kids to sit at, and they can kind of color while the, while the service is on as well. So just wanted to point those out as options for people. Now, I believe that's all the announcements I had. Uh, is there an announcement or two that I am missing? All right, I've done it. Uh, so, oh, Annette. I have the second page for the Ready? Okay, so for those of you who are uh, who have been coming every Sunday, we are working on the fruit of the spirits uh, in our uh, summer worship service, and uh, we are hoping to have them memorized. And so, Annette has the second page for those of you who took page one home uh, a week or so ago. So, if you are working on memorizing the fruit of the spirit. Uh, please see Annette after the service and she can give you the second page that she has done up to help us. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, why don't we, if you've got your Bibles, uh, turn to Psalm chapter 30 and uh, I will read it as we uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to come and worship the Lord. So, Psalm 30. <laughs> I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O oh Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, 
I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I call. To the Lord, I cry for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks forever. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads and give thanks to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that as we read this psalm and we consider these words, we can really picture our own lives in there. In the fact that you rescued us from the pit of sin. That you came while we were still sinners. And you sent Jesus Christ to pay the price to rescue us from our sins. Oh Lord, we are truly in awe of that. And that is why we are here. We are here to rejoice and sing and praise you because you have removed the guilt of sin and clothed us in your righteousness and you call us your sons and your daughters. And we can call you our Father. So Father, we praise you and we thank you. And Lord, we pray that during this time of worship, we would just be able to experience your glory. We pray that you would move among us, that you would soften our hearts so that we can experience your joy, the joy that comes from you as we gather here. So Lord, meet with us and guide us. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, amen. Uh, I'm going to have Wendy come up and lead us in a couple of, I guess, minister to us in music uh, as Wendy is uh, preparing two songs for us. Well, good morning and welcome, and welcome to those who are um, watching the service at home as well, and those who may be downstairs, so um, welcome. It is always a good time to praise the Lord. Um, the first song that I've chosen, it's called Isn't He Wonderful, and it's kind of a medley of songs. So you may recognize it, you can hum along. Um, I know we're still not singing congregationally and that's a big thing for a lot of us, but um, anyway, I, I hope you can meditate on the words. And the second song is called Amazing Love and it was the word, so. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? You 
So this week we learned a new song. Thank you. <laughs> and it's called I'm Trusting You God. So the kids, some of them have instruments today. And we have some actions. You guys remember the actions? All right. repeat the line and then I sing the next line and you repeat it and then I yeah, yeah, we know. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you, kids. You can sit down now. So as you can see, our, the week at uh, Backyard Bible Club was lots of fun with lots of energy from the kids. And uh, this was a small group of the kids. I think there was about 14 kids that came regularly. And uh, they were all full of energy and excitement and uh, wanting to learn about who Christ was. And I was chatting with Annette, and one of the things that caught my attention, or I thought was really cool, was when some of the invites were sent out, when there was some talking about asking people to come. It might have been to this one, or it might have been our one that we did earlier in the summer. Some of the parents said, well... My kids don't know anything about the Bible. Is it okay if they still come? And the net's like, yes, that's what we want. So that's exciting when kids come and uh, we're able to share the good news of Christ with them. So, uh, so that was just a glimpse. And uh, so next year we're going to do it again. And uh, I would just encourage you to be thinking about and praying about how you can play a part in ministering to these kids that are hungry and wanting to, to learn about Christ. Uh, so that leads us into our time where we would normally take up our tithes and our offerings, where we would normally pass the basket around and we would take time to, to praise the Lord for his wonderful blessings. And so today I would just like to pray. We're going to pray for our offering, but I'm also going to pray and challenge us as we're praying, ask the Lord to speak to us as individuals about how we can use the gifts and the talents that he's given us to be able to do the work of, of his work here on earth, of how we can spread the message of hope and salvation that Christ gives. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us, for the, uh, the physical blessings that you provide for us to make our lives more comfortable. But Lord, we thank you most importantly and most of all for the blessing of your Son, Jesus Christ, that he paid the price that we couldn't pay. And Father, we, we thank you that um, he took our place and Lord, I, I pray for us as individuals and as a church. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts and our minds and that you would make us aware of the needs around us, the need that people have to hear this message of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be bold and wanting to share that message. I pray that you would help us to desire to Spread that message with our neighbors, uh, with our children, with our family members. And I pray that their hearts will be soft to hear that message. Father God, we also think of uh, the missionaries that we support. Uh, we think of Conrad and Fiona as they are in Thailand ministering and serving you. Father, we pray a blessing on them today and we ask that uh, they would be able to uh, share your message boldly where they are at as well. So help us, Lord, as we try to be your hands and your feet here on earth. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. All right, so I'm just going to go up and move the pulpit and try not to uh, dump over the flowers that Teresa has given us. And uh, while I'm doing that, if you want to turn in your Bibles to our, our scripture verse, it's going to be Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start out there. And uh, we're going to do the fruit of the, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, wait a minute, kids. I almost forgot my children's story. Why didn't you say anything? You wanted to, but your parents told you not to, didn't they? Yeah, well, okay. So, who here is having a good day today? Who's having a really good, happy day? Okay. I'm seeing a few hands that are going up. So would this represent you if you're having a good, happy day? Is this what you would look like? Yeah? Yeah. 
All right, who here is not having a happy day? Who here is grumpy and not having a good day? Who woke up and tried to have a shower and just cold water came out? Uh-oh. So would this be you today? It doesn't look like you're smiling way too much. That's what you did look like. Okay, okay. So I'm going to run through a few things, and I'm going to get you to tell me what type of a face we would have if this was happening in our lives. So if it was a nice, bright, sunny day out, would you be like this, or would you be like this? All right, I'll get you to clap for whatever one you think is right, okay? Like this, or like this, if it's a sunny day. Okay, all right, all right. What if you fell down while you were riding your bike and scraped your knee all up? Would you be like this, or would you be like this? All right. What if you were going to a party and there was going to be some of your friends there? Would you be like this, or would you be like this? <laughs> or would you be like this? Okay. What if you got a new puppy? What if you were all alone and by yourself? <laughs> what if you lost your favorite toy? What if you got an ice cream cone? <laughs> what if you were having an argument with your best friend? Well, you know what? When we think of all of these things, the things that make us happy and the things that make us sad, it's pretty simple. When we, when we think of good times, that generally makes us happy. But when we think of the bad things, sad things, that generally makes us feel sad. But you know what? Jesus tells us something that is very important for us to always remember. And it should help us even when we're having happy days and even when we're having sad days. Jesus said to us that he loves us and that he tells us that he loves us and that he cares for us so that we can have joy in our lives. So, you know, when I was a kid and when I was feeling sad, I would go and talk to my mom. And my mom would always make me feel better. My mom had that special way. She would give me a hug or give me a kiss. Or if my mom wasn't around, my dad was all right too. He didn't necessarily give me a hug or a kiss. He probably beat me up or something like that. And that made me feel pretty good too, because that's what dads can do. But there's going to be times when people aren't there, like a mom or a dad, to make us feel better. But Jesus says, I am always there. And I always love you. I love you when you do well on your report cards. And I love you when you're feeling sad and you've done bad on a test or you're having a fight with your best friend. I love you and you are special and you are loved. And if we think about that, that this guy Jesus, and you guys learned about this this week, what did he do? He created earth, didn't he? He made everything in the earth, all the amazing things. Yet he still loves each one of you. And you are special and important to him. And that should fill us with a little bit of joy and help us to feel love. Yeah, Trina. Fruit of the Spirit, like those grapes. You're right. You're right. So I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to ask God's blessing on you guys, okay? 
Okay, so let, let's pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the kids. I thank you for the wonderful time that they had this week learning about you. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to know that you love them and that you care for them. And I pray that you would help them to look to you for joy instead of, instead of looking to the ways of the world. So Lord, we ask this in your name. All right, thanks guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for, for clapping and, and sharing what makes you feel good and what makes you feel sad. So, uh, big people and little people, if you've got your Bibles, now I would invite you uh, to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. And uh, we're going to be eventually looking at verses 16 through to 23, or I guess 19 through to 23. But then also, while you're flipping in your Bible, I would encourage you to also go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. So, so go there and stick your finger in that spot as well, uh, because that's going to be our main verse for today. But we are sticking to our, our verses of the fruit of the Spirit as well. And so... The Bible tells us, uh, this is where we're going we're gonna to start at verses 22 to 23 of Galatians 5. The Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as Christians, when we have the Holy Spirit living in us. That is what the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. It's not something that we can produce. It's not something we work harder at to try and do it on our own. That is something that is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Last week, I, I told a little story about how my garden, well, not my garden, Wendy's garden, is growing. And I could go out, and I went out, and I listened really hard to see if I could hear or see the stalks of corn working hard at producing the corn cob. And I didn't see any work going on. I even listened really closely, and I didn't see any grunting or any groaning going on. The corn on the stock was a byproduct of what was going on. And that's just like us. If the Holy Spirit is living in us, the fruit of the Spirit is there. But there's a battle going on. And Paul tells us about this battle. And the battle that is going on is in direct contrast to our sinful nature or to the ways of the world. And Paul explains what those are in verse 19. He says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, adultery and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see that in the world, don't we? We just need to turn on the news and we can see almost all of those being listed in our evening newscast. But it's not just on the news that that's happening. There is a battle going on with our sinful nature of us desiring to do that. To fall into those old habits. Our sinful flesh produces a certain type of fruit as well. And so our Christian life is a battle. And as Christians though, we have the Holy Spirit to help us, to give us the strength and the power to conquer these sinful acts. As a Christian, we will, as a Christian living here on earth, we will never totally have 
complete victory over that. But each day, as we are growing closer to the Lord, we should have victories as the Spirit moves within us. As we look to God to give us guidance. Some of the fruits of the Spirit, last week we looked at love, this week we're going to look at joy, are tough when we think about them. We probably would like to have joy all the time. But I know if I'm being truthful, and if you are being truthful, joy is probably one of the harder things for me to always experience. Like with the kids. If I'm going to a party, joy is, that's easy to have happen. But if I'm going to a funeral, or if I'm having a difficult time, when I'm struggling to make ends meet, when I'm looking at my long list of bills that are owed, and I'm looking at the very small little amount in my bank account, it's hard to feel joy at that point in time. Or during this difficult time where we've been separated from our loved ones, some of us have family members that we haven't been able to see and we're longing to see and we're worried about them, but we can't because of COVID-19. It can be difficult to experience joy. Or some of us, this will be easier for some than others, to think back to school, to think back to getting a bad report card or having a big assignment due. It's hard to feel joy in that. Or what about thinking back to when you were going for your driver's license and you were trying to parallel park half an hour before you had to do your test and you kept messing it up? Were you feeling joy at that point in time? I think all of us have situations where we don't feel joy. But even in situations like those, we can be joyful because joy is something that the Holy Spirit produces. It's not something that we have to conjure up on our own. It's not like when I go to the movie theater and I have to pull $20 out of my pocket and pay for the movie tickets. It's something that the Spirit is working on in our lives. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to flip over to the Hebrews chapter 12 verses, chapters 12 verses 2 and 3. And this is where I, we're going to spend a little bit more time. And uh, this, uh, this passage is a, a passage that talks about joy. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Here ends the reading of God's word. So I think we need to remember one thing. Joy is not the same as happiness. Joy and happiness are different. Hitting green lights all the way to work makes you happy. Getting rear-ended in the parking lot makes us unhappy. Happiness is circumstantial. Happiness is kind of like a firefly. It can turn on and off depending on our circumstances. Joy is different. Joy isn't a feeling. Joy is more of a knowing. Our text said that Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross 
scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' joy didn't come about by looking at the cross and thinking, I can't wait to get up there and experience the brutal pain that I'm about to have. The joy that Jesus had came from knowing that he was about to make peace between sinful humanity and our holy God. He wasn't happy anticipating the agony of the cross, being abandoned by his father, taking on the weight of our sins. No, he was overwhelmed with sorrow. As you read through the Gospels, you will find that he was so overwhelmed with sorrow at, about, at, at what was about to happen that drops of blood came out of his tears when he thought about the pain. But even in sorrow, even in knowing what was about to happen, the joy of doing his Father's will was in his heart. The joy of knowing that he was about to make the way for sinful mankind to be reconciled to God caused him to have joy. So joy isn't a feeling. Joy is a knowing. Joy is a knowing who God is and the love that he has for us. And that should change our outlook. That should change our outlook when we are experiencing the toils and the difficulties in this life. Romans 8 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. What is he going to hold back if he is going to do that? That should give us joy. The joy in knowing who God is and the love he has for us. And the work that he is doing. Everything that God is doing in our lives is for our good. James tells us that we need to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials. Because when we face these trials, it produces and develops perseverance in our lives. It's clear that when we are experiencing difficulties, God is working in our lives in order to conform us to his ways. So we need to have a proper perspective of what's happening and going on around us. We need to understand what God is trying to produce in our lives. We need to understand that God is for us and he is working out all of these things for us and for his glory. And that should cause us to have joy. That even though we may not be happy about what's going on, God still has a plan, and he is still moving, and he is still sitting on the throne, and his plan is moving forward. But I know for myself, as a Christian, many of you, as myself, I don't feel joy. I lose focus, and I get distracted. I don't fix my eyes on Jesus, and instead I fix it on something else. 
we are to fix our eyes on Christ. How many of you have ever desired to buy something? Like a, with me, I wanted to buy a tablet. And uh, when I was going out, and Marvin probably knows this very well, when you want to buy a tablet, you fix your eyes on it. And you go out and you research which tablet you want. You compare the different tablets. And then you look for the best deal, and then you buy it. And when you get your tablet home, you start playing with it, and you're enjoying your tablet. You fixed your eyes on what you wanted. You went out and bought it. And then how many of you leave it at that? Do you ever take the manual out to read through the tablet to learn how to use it? I do. Not always. But when you read through the tablet and you fix your eyes on the instructions, it tells you how to use your tablet properly and how to get the most out of it. If you don't read the manual, if you don't fix your eyes on the manual and learn about the tablet, you're not going to get the most out of your new tablet. And you can do the same thing with cameras. You can do the same thing with TVs or whatever you buy. Uh, I know somebody this week who bought a new car. And that person is excited for the car. But that person is going to need to read the manual in order to, do, in order to use the new car properly. Our life is the same way. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And if we are not reading the manual, we are not going to be able to experience the joy that there is in the Christian life. If we are not taking time to fix our eyes on Jesus, then we will not know the true joy that there is. So in difficult times, we need to focus on God in difficult times and good times. The book of Philippians has a whole lot to say about joy. Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which trans transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So as Christians, we need to be thinking about, pondering about, rejoicing about Jesus Christ. It is important for us in all things to do that. That passage I just read talks about rejoicing in him, talks about praying, talks about reading God's word. Are we doing those things? Are we spending time knowing who Jesus is so that we can truly experience his joy? What are our eyes fixed upon? I know sometimes it's easy for our eyes to get fixed on something else. And it's not that something else that is going to be with us in difficult times. I know a lot of times what we do is we 
try to get joy out of other things in our life. We put things instead of Jesus as number one. Things that in and of themselves are good, but shouldn't be the number one thing. So I know for some people, it's their children. They invest everything they have in their kids. We get our joy out of our children. Well, what happens? Eventually our children act like children and let us down. Or even worse, eventually our children move out and leave us and go far away. So now we're in our joy. Or what about my wife? Shouldn't I have my joy in my wife? Look at Wendy, she's amazing. It would be a good thing for me to put my joy in her. But as amazing as Wendy is, there are going to be times where I'm wrong and we have a fight. Notice I said that I'm wrong? <laughs> but I'm not going, if, I, if my joy is in Wendy, my joy is going to be gone when I'm fighting. If we're putting our joy in our jobs, or in our careers, or in things of this world, when something happens, our joy is going to waver. As Christians, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus so that our joy comes. John Piper had a quote, and I want to read this about what joy is. Um, joy from the Holy Spirit sets our souls free from cultural kudos and cultural conformity. When your joy comes from God, and it's an absolutely unshakable through grief, affliction, weakness, poverty, shame, dishonor, persecution, loss. The culture loses its power to control you. You are a free person. If you take a stand that the culture hates or speaks a word that the culture condemns, the culture shames you. They persecute you. They plunder you. They cancel you. Your joy, though, remains unshaken, and you are free. You are not controlled, but you are free. When you are a citizen, when your citizenship is in heaven, and all your inheritance is in heaven, and all your joy is coming from Christ in heaven, then you are a free person here on planet Earth. And the culture cannot touch you. If your joy comes from the world with its benefits, its comforts, and its praises, then you are like a leaf in the wind. Yours is not a serious joy, but it's a second-hand joy. And you are not free. You're jerked around by the newscast every day, by a phone call, by a critical email, by a word from a friend, your emotions are jerked every which way, like a leaf in the wind. All your joy is attached to that person, this person, their approval, that house, that car, that comfort, those jewels, that inheritance, that friend, that wife, that pet, that baby, whatever you've put your joy in. You are not a free person. But serious joy comes from God. It's always come from God. So when we as Christians put our joy and have our joy in Christ, it doesn't matter what's happening around us. When we have that knowledge, of the love of Christ. It doesn't matter 
what's going on around us. Today's world is brutal. Today's world is all about canceling people or writing people off if you don't have the same opinion as them. If we are worried about other people's opinion, if we find our joy in being accepted by the world, we will not ever truly have real joy. We will be slaves. If I'm constantly trying to have my joy fulfilled in Wendy, it sounds like a good thing, but it's not. Because true joy only comes when I'm truly concerned about God's ways. When I enjoy the inheritance and the riches that come from God above anything that the world has, then I am free to live a life here on earth that is full of freedom and joy. When I don't care what the world thinks, and I don't care about what God thinks, I am free from the shackles of the world. No matter what people say, no matter what they say or do to me, I don't care because I know the joy in Jesus Christ. It sets us free to love those who are unlovable. It sets us free to experience God on earth. It sets us free to share the love of God with the world and not worry about persecution. That is what true joy is about. That is what Paul was getting at. If you remember the whole part of scripture that we looked at in Galatians about how we are free, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that our, we are no longer slaves to trying to earn our salvation, but Christ did it all on the cross. We are free. And because we are free, we experience God's love. And we can experience His joy. So what are we doing? Are we trying to do it on our own? Are we trying to add something to our salvation? Or are we fixing our eyes on Christ? And are we allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives? Only then do we experience freedom and joy. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you love us and that you care for us. And Lord, we thank you that no matter what is going on in the world, we have the knowledge and the wisdom that you do care for us. And Father God, I pray that you would help us. Lord, we need your help in so many ways. But Father, I pray that you would help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to experience you. Help us to not get distracted with the things of this world, but Lord, that we would find our joy in you. Lord, I pray that as we are thinking about that right now, you would convict us Lord, I pray that you would point out to us what we are placing our joy in instead of you. 
And Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength, the courage to cut that out and to put you in that place so that our joy can be completed. So Lord, we ask this in your precious name. We are, uh, before we leave, we're going to take a few moments uh, to pray as a congregation um, where we can encourage each other with items of praise that are going on in our lives, or we can share with each other items that we would like people to be in prayer for this coming week. Um, so I would just wait on you now for any items of praise that you would like to share with the congregation or any items of uh, request that you would like us to be in prayer for.